Well, good afternoon. And if you're joining us from other time zones, good morning, good evening. I am Shevin Yeltekin, Dean of the Simon Business School. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first session of Simon Proud Industry Insights, a new event series aimed at learning from and engaging with industry experts amongst our Simon alumni and faculty. We kick off this new program highlighting senior alumni leaders in FinTech, a topic I have a deep interest in. Technology-enabled innovation is changing the way we make payments, the way we participate in financial markets, the way we invest. It's changing financial transactions, banking, wealth management, and importantly, their cost and point of access. It's affecting policy, regulation, the underbanked and the unbanked, and all industries. We don't need to be researchers and pr practitioners of this area. We as consumers participate in it on a daily basis. So developments in this area affect all of us. I'm grateful to all of our panelists, our moderator and participants to take the time to talk with us and learn with us today. I will hand the program over to Professor Dan Burnside in a second, but I just wanna give you a brief introduction. Dan is a 2001 MBA graduate of Simon and received his PhD from Cornell University. He's clinical professor of finance at the Simon School and is the faculty director of Simon's master's in finance program. He has taught courses on investment theory and practice at Simon for over 20 years and is a recipient of the MBA Superior Teaching Award. Before joining the faculty full-time in 2018, then worked in the investment business, holding various roles in the investment risk management and financial planning fields. His final position was as Director of Equity Risk Management at Federated Investors, a $350 billion asset management company. So Dan, over to you. Thank you, Dean Yeltekin. Uh, I am uh, Dan Burnside and I'm your moderator for this panel discussion today. Uh, it's great to have everybody here. Uh, I looked at the attendance list and I recognize a lot of names. So I'm uh, glad to have you with us. Uh, let me explain briefly how the uh, panel uh, discussion will run. I'm gonna briefly introduce the three alumni panelists. And then I'm gonna make a few short remarks about FinTech myself, just to kind of get us warmed up. And uh, then I'll ask uh, questions that were submitted in advance uh, and uh, hopefully, time permitting, we'll get to questions as they come in live as well. So I encourage you to use the Zoom uh, uh, Q&A function and throw us some questions and we'll work them into the uh, discussion. So with that, let me get to the introductions. So uh, the first panelist is Joe Abrams. Uh, Joe is Simon MBA, class of 1974. Uh, Joe manages the uh, Cicero Consulting Group a strategic consulting firm. Uh, Joe is a very successful tech entrepreneur. Uh, for over 40 years, he's been working with emerging growth companies in uh, technology, drug discovery, uh, consumer products, uh, online job placement. Uh, currently, he's working in an interesting uh, project involving uh, currency transfer and exchange, which has a a significant fintech component and maybe that will come up in the conversation. Uh, Joe co-founded the software toolworks and also Intermix Media. Uh, Intermix owned among other things uh, the MySpace social network, a name that uh, I suspect you probably recognize. Uh, Joe sits on several advisory boards. Uh, he's also a trustee of the university and a member of the Simon National Council. Uh, he's a major driver of the Simon School Venture Capital Fund. Um, and Joe received the Simon Distinguished Alumnus Award in uh, 2017. So uh, Joe, let me just say hi. And... Sure. Uh, thanks, Dan. Let me add my uh, welcome to everybody, um, the panelists, the attendees, and, and everybody associated with this. Um, just as a, a brief background, um, I started really in technology when I used the internet for the first time in 1974. And, um, and, and uh, you know, that may sound glamorous, but basically it was a bunch of uh, scientists and professors, mostly playing games with each other around the world. You know, some sophisticated games like chess and other things like the original adventure, Colossal uh, Cave, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I've been 
on the, on the technology side, I've been involved since the middle 1970s. Software Toolworks was a very early stage publishing company, first publishing on eight inch floppies, then going to five and a quarter inch, then going to three and a half inch, then CD-ROM, et cetera, et cetera. As you mentioned, MySpace was a social network before anybody knew what a social network was. And um, I've continued to stay involved with um, technology companies and startup companies, um, most recently as it pertains to FinTech and also as a disclosure item, uh, I am an investor in Robinhood and um, that at one point um, looked like a good investment, then at one point it looked like a really bad investment and now again looks like a really good investment. So. You know, it, it, and this is all in the space of about three months. So uh, that doesn't mean I have any more insight than anybody else, because when you're an inv involved in, in a company like that, you know, you, you don't have any more information than what the public has. And also, as you mentioned, um, I'm an investor and an advisor in a company called IPSI, which really focuses on serving the underbanked and international um funds transfer, um, early stage, um, you know, basically as a startup, but uh, so it runs the gamut of what I do. Thanks, Joe. All right, let me uh, introduce our second panelist, Lance Drummond. <clears throat> Lance is uh, Simon MBA class of 1985. Uh, he's the retired executive VP of operations and technology at TD Bank, uh, Toronto Dominion, if you didn't know what that stood for. Uh, before that, among others, he was at Bank of America and Fiserv. Uh, now, Fiserv may not um, be a name you're familiar with because it, it's a business that provides services to other businesses, but it's the major player in uh, providing financial services and fintech uh, to the major financial players, the, the big banks, and so on. Um, currently, Lance wears a couple uh, regulatory hats. He's one of the public board governors uh, of FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And um, he's also an independent director at Freddie Mac, the federal home loan uh, mortgage corp. Um, Lance, like Joe, is a UR trustee and uh, he has endowed scholarships uh, at Simon and at the college. Uh, and I've had some of those students. Thank you, Lance. <laughs> um, Lance is uh, the 2006 recipient of the Simon uh, Distinguished Alumnus Award. So I'll turn it over to you, Lance. Say hi. Hey, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Dan. And, um, you know, I know we've got limited time, so I just want to say that uh, it's really an honor to be uh, with you today, and I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, providing some some additional insights to our uh, to our audience. Thank you. Great. And now we're on to the uh, third panelist, Suzanne Lay. <clears throat> Suzanne is Simon MBA 2004. She started her career post Simon at the New York Federal Reserve, and then moved uh, from that into investment banking specializing in financial services and specifically in fintech. Uh, she worked at, among others, uh, Barclays, uh, Bank of Tokyo, uh, Credit Agricole, and she currently advises startup clients on a wide variety of matters, uh, including uh, raising funding and venture capital. And she's a sought out uh, speaker uh, at conferences uh, covering financial services uh, and fintech. So Suzanne, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you all so much. It's it's great to be at least virtually back at Simon. Um, I grew up in Rochester, so um, I you know I get I come back every so often when I go back and see my family. But um, it's really great to be here. I spent a lot of time talking to various groups about fintech topics. I think one of the topics that's most interesting for me um, and has been for quite some time is the intersection between kind of traditional financial services, the banking world that that a lot of us came from and sort of emerging emerging technologies and how those how those ecosystems are competing, collaborating, um, and just continuing to engage 
over the years because I think that, you know, my personal thesis is that's, you know, trying to figure out collaborative ways for banks which have um, great power um, in their client bases with merging technologies which have, you know, are able to like move, move fast and break things. Um, as I like to say, you know, the, the power of both of those together is really going to elevate financial services going forward if, if they're able to work together. But it's great to, great to be here um, and big shout out to everybody in my, my network who's not from Simon that decided to join today. Um, Simon is a great community. I'm happy to have everyone here. Great, thank you, Suzanne. So uh, let me, before I get to the questions, just <clears throat> make a few comments about FinTech. Uh, just kind of get us warmed up and throw out some terminology that I think may, may come up. Uh, FinTech may be defined as uh, a new financial industry that uh, applies technology to improve financial activities. Uh, that sounds uh, innocent enough, but the reality is that FinTech uh, is creating new industries and it's disrupting or on the verge of disrupting uh, major industries that have existed for a long time. Uh, FinTech may seem exotic or foreign to you, but uh, if you, you have used FinTech, if you've used uh, Robinhood or Apple Pay or Venmo uh, or Kickstarter, uh, you've used FinTech if you own Bitcoin or if you've done anything financial on your phone, like depositing a check or sending someone a payment, uh, those are the some of the consumer applications of FinTech. Um, those tools are easy to use, but uh, there's a lot of horsepower uh, under the surface that makes those things work, uh, uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence of all kinds, uh, cloud processing and uh, storage, robotic process automation, blockchain, biometrics, uh, internet of things, 5G, natural language processing. So I just threw out some, some of the things that are going on there just to make the point that FinTech has a lot of tech uh, in it. So uh, with that uh, preface, uh, let's dive into some questions. So uh, maybe it's helpful to start out with some history. So. Initially, before fintech became associated with those consumer products, like the ones that I, I just mentioned, uh, it referred specifically to technology that was applied uh, in the back end uh, systems of large financial institutions like banks and what we call the back office. Uh, and this sounds like uh, something that Lance uh, probably has uh, some some history with, and uh, I'm going to ask him to tell us what it was like uh, so, at the beginning, so to speak, of, of fintech. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, you know, I, I think uh, first of all, to give a little bit of history, I, I, I ran a couple of uh, really large operations at uh, both TD and at Bank of America. Uh, Bank of America, roughly 21,000 plus people that were doing back office type uh, transactions. And you may hear me use the term sneaker net as I sort of give you a little bit of background here. But um, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, consumer interaction was primarily occurring in physical channels, uh, you know, branches, uh, phone, uh, phone centers, uh, ATMs, broker dealers, lock boxes. I mean, those were all physical types of things. And most transactions were paper-based. You know, very few of them were actually real-time. Uh, some were, were sort of quasi-real-time, but most transactions were, were pretty much either uh, batched or processed overnight. Uh, in fact, you know, the, if I recall, the only real sort of true frictionless transaction were wire, wire transfers, which are still the case today. Uh, back office infrastructure really supporting those channels were mainly comprised of things like mainframe servers, check processing machines. Uh, and just to give you some idea of what those things look like, it could be as long as, um, you know, uh, roughly uh, 100 feet long for processing checks. It looks similar to what you would see in a post office. Um, you, you know, most of the communications was done uh, via 300 and 1200 baud modems, I'm sure. Many of your 
uh, many of our audience won't even have an idea what the heck that is. And then there were all these hard hardwired ethernet networks that we used to sort of move stuff around. Uh, the applications and systems, uh, legacy systems were expensive to develop. They cost a lot of money and really expensive to maintain. Uh, it took uh, a long time if you had to make a change uh, to actually get those done. Uh, and a lot of those were in place to support these paper-based and again, what I call a sneaker net system. And to sort of describe what a sneaker net system is, is that you, know, you have one piece of paper, you move it from one person's uh, physical inbox to another person's physical inbox where they would add some value. And then you'd move it to another person's uh, physical inbox. And, and, and that's how things got done, primarily in the financial services in, industry for many, many years. And, and then sort of a, a big thing started to happen, right? Joe talked a little bit about the internet, but the internet really didn't blossom until uh, you know the, the late 80s, early 90s, or start to blossom. And from my view, there are really eight industry trends that began fueling uh, the FinTech surge. Uh, the internet, uh, mobile phones, consumer behavior, consumers getting more comfortable working with, uh, with technology, the ability to sort of know your customers across multiple channels or what I call KYC, uh, open source uh, technology and APIs, meaning you were able to now take uh, new technologies and interface them with old legacy systems through APIs. Uh, the, the growth of uh, digital infrastructure, uh, on-demand and real-time uh, infrastructure being built out, wireless systems, uh, digital business models, uh, you know, sort of the simplification of how you would do financial transactions. In fact, you'll hear the term, um, I suspect later, around gamification, Robinhood uh, being probably a primary example of that. And then, of course, you know, industry consolidation in the banking industry and across financial services, because maintaining those legacy systems I talked about a little bit earlier became truly expensive uh, to maintain. And then sort of the last uh, point I would make around change that, that really tried, started to drive FinTech uh, was some of the lagging uh, legislative and regulatory infrastructure. Uh, you know, to some extent, you see a little bit of that unveiling itself, again, using Robin Hood as the example, right? Now, uh, people are really getting a sense of what's going on there. And so the legislatures, uh, the, the Congress and uh, regulatory bodies are now starting to pay much more attention. Uh, and these high, high velocity and frictionless transactions are really what's fueled FinTech and what I would call the e-commerce um, you know, economy. I, I think the, Blockchain technology, which I know we're going to talk about, is probably the next thing that will sort of vault us into the next level. So, Joe, that's sort of my opening salvo on, um, on sort of from back then, somewhat to now. Uh, and I know we'll talk a lot more about a, a number of other items. Yeah, Lance, I, I think you did a great job of kind of setting the table and also speaking from um, the perspective of large financial institutions. Um, I have the, I don't know if it's the good fortune or misfortune of never having worked for a large institution. So everything you've said scares me, <laughs> okay? I look at it from the other side, which is the advantage of a small company is to build, to target, you know, when, when you're at Bank of America, you've got millions of customers that you've got to say, how does this affect each one of those customers? When you have no customers, you have the luxury of saying, I'm going to target my solution towards the underserved, the international, whatever. You have no legacy systems that you have to protect. You have no retail locations that you have to support. And so you have the ability to pick and choose. 
on, on one side. On the other side, technology moves so fast and is so lightweight. Um, you know, I can remember I had a summer job working for Bayesian Company, which I'm sure there's probably three people, you know, on this, uh, on this that remembers Bayesian Company before even Prudential Beige. And my job was to take stock market transactions on big reels of tape and upload them to uh, IBM Systems 360s so that people's accounts could be updated overnight as opposed to real-time trading. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you don't have the fear of, you know, worrying about what to protect behind you and you're always looking to go forward, that can be an advantage. And that's the, that's the world for whatever reason, uh, you know, I like to play in. Yeah, I think I'll add um, maybe something a bit from kind of the business side of the house. I've been, I've, you know, I've been in sort of the the business side of banking for you know 15 years, and um, you know what I've seen. I was never a technology person. Like I went to Simon, I did my MBA like everybody else. I did my spreadsheets, I did my PowerPoint. You know, went to Wall Street and never really thought about technology. It was just the stuff in the back office that seemed to work fine. And then it didn't. <laughs> um, and then, you know, then this technology thing happened. And um, those of us who, you know, are kind of naturally curious people, we started, you know, a lot of my friends started, started asking ourselves, like, what's like, like, why are our institutions not able to keep up with, um, you know, with the rapidly changing technology landscape and the financial crisis of 2008 didn't help matters to say the least. Um, but from a sort of a business perspective, I think one of the biggest challenges that I see, at least from, um, you know, a senior management perspective, like making, making decisions, it's a lot of senior leadership in these big banks don't necessarily have like deep technology backgrounds. They were heads of trading desks. They were head of corporate investment banking. Like they don't necessarily know like blockchain for this and AI for this and machine learning for that. And I, and I think that that's that you know the the not necessarily knowing how to solve a, how, solve some of these problems is is a big challenge. And you know certainly senior execs are getting smarter on these things, but you would rarely see somebody who is a head of technology rising to you know the you know as a ceo of a large bank so they're they're trying to position themselves now as big te big tech companies but i think that there's still some big gaps um in in where the comfort level of senior executives in financial services on issues of technology they're definitely getting a lot smarter but there's definitely a learning curve that i know that i had to have that i had to like take on myself um when i was learning about these things having been in finance for so long yeah, just uh, just to add real quickly, Dan, one, one of the challenges that these large institutions have, right, is that they have uh, these sort of existing business models that they're sort of operating with, right? Um, so if you look at how banks used to make money 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it was, you know, you take a deposit in, you, you then uh, lend the deposit, you get a spread on that deposit and, and you know, you got net interest income and that's how you made your money. Um, and given the compression in interest rates and given sort of the onslaught of new technologies into the industry, that whole business model has been destroyed, blown up. I remember back in, uh, you know, roughly 12, 13 years ago, um, meeting with the top management to Susan's point and pointing out that PayPal was this very serious player <laughs> that was going to happen. Uh, and, and, and pointing out that, the, the, that Walmart, in fact, was evolving to be a bank. And how did I figure that out? I went to Walmart, parked in the parking lot and watched literally a line snake around the, the building as people went in, cashed their checks and got a, a, a card, a debit card to go in and purchase their goods. And, and so I, I think to Susan's point and to the point that Joe made, 
banks have certainly lagged for a number of years uh, and primarily because they had this existing business model, they had these legacy systems, they sort of had, but I would tell you one of the things to sort of watch is to watch what's going on at JP Morgan Chase and what's going on at Bank of America, okay? To the point earlier that Joe made, they have tens of millions of customers already and they are absolutely due to the use of APIs and a bunch of other technologies that they're now adapting to sort of fuel and leverage their, their, uh, their, their systems, their legacy systems. They are now working at light speed to do a lot of different things. So I'm sure there are people on this call that use Zelle as an example, Z-E-L-L-E. Um, Zelle was an idea that came from a FinTech company and Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, et cetera, jumped all over it. And now it competes with Venmo, it competes with a lot of other uh, tools that are out there in the marketplace. So I, I think um, to, to the point that my uh, esteemed uh, panelists are, are making, certainly financial institutions have lagged for years, but they're catching up very, very fast and they have to. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a requirement and necessity in order to survive. You know, I, I, I think that what's, what's really interesting is that as recently as 10 years ago, um, you wouldn't perceive a, finan a major financial institution as being um, committed to technology and consumer applications. They mostly lagged and protected. And now I think what Suzanne and Lance have talked about is the fact that they realize if they don't, if, if they don't get involved early on in these businesses, somebody else will and they'll get bigger than they are. Yeah. So, um, you know, whereas 15 years ago, if Lance had gone in and said, you know, we really need to get into some form of consumer electronic transfer of funds, people would have said, if you want to do that, Lance, go start a company, you know. I, I did, Joe, by the way, just to be clear, uh, they did tell, they, they did tell <laughs> me to go. <laughs> that, that wasn't going to work. In fact, they were absolutely convinced that PayPal was going to fail. And just one quick comment on that. Um, I, I actually met with the CEO, Scott Thompson, at the time at PayPal. And when I was meeting with him, I pointed out that big banks thought that PayPal was going to fail. And he started laughing. And I said to him, why are you laughing? He said, but I said, the reason we think you're gonna fail is that you're going to have a major fraud event or some sort of event where you're going to find that you know, either your capital or, or something's gonna happen uh, on the fraud side and started laughing. And he said to me, you know, the real, the real interesting thing is, is you guys don't really know what we do. And I said, what do you mean? He said, what do you think the largest part of our organization is? And I said, well, you're software developers. And he started laughing and he said, no, it's our CRM part of the organization. It's our fraud organization because we know more about our customers than you can ever begin to imagine knowing about your customers. And that was sort of an aha moment for me. And, uh, and we now know what PayPal is, right? So. Yeah, and PayPal has been able to do a lot of what they do without the, without the headcount that the, that the big banks have. Like exactly. they, this, the things that, that you and I know, Lance, that, you know, require you know teams of people to do mm -hmm. paypal was able to just set up computers and run these run these algorithms um so they just they had an advantage built in um to the system and thankfully they had some really great people at the outset but that's that's going to continue to be a problem and when you know when people talk about the 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 ability for banks going forward to significantly reduce headcount as automation happens, that's a real that's a real issue. That, you know that's that's not that's not a joke. It's not a farce. Um, and we've seen it. We've seen it with companies like PayPal, which you know their revenue per head per headcount is astronomical yeah. um, because they've been able to do a lot of what they do without without humans behind it. Okay. Very good. 
let's uh, somehow in that discussion, Lance, the thing that was coming to my head was, I don't know if you know who Steve Sasson is, the guy who used to work at Kodak, who invented the digital camera. Well, it was invented at Kodak. I'll just leave that there. There's a moral there somewhere. Uh, well, you know, I worked, to, at, you know I worked at Kodak, Dan, so that's yeah, I know. why you're throwing that particular bar yeah. in. I'll just throw one other one out for you. I'm sure most people may not may have heard may have LED TVs, and one of the more interesting parts of the Kodak story is they invented organic light emitting diodes and then decided not to invest in it. And guess what is the main structure of LED technologies in yep. your television? Yep. Organic and my and my camera. Light emitting diodes. Yep. They had all the patents. They they gave all the patents away. So yeah, I, I get it. And similar issues that with banks, right? And and so I I, I think most banks are, are figuring it out though to the point that we just just made. Okay, so let me uh, change gears, but maybe not that much uh, to a subject that a lot of people were interested in when they signed up, uh, which is a current event, right? Would anyone like to weigh in on the FinTech aspects of uh, the GameStop event? Uh, I guess I should say GameStop, Robinhood, Reddit, Citadel, Melvin Capital. You know, there are a lot of people involved in that news story. Um, I don't have a specific question, but I just have some, well, I have some nagging questions. You know, was that a problem caused by FinTech? Or is FinTech gonna save us from things like that in the future? Uh, we is should it, let is, the it, good, is it a good idea it. to let people trade stocks on their We should phone? let the expert talk about this, yeah. the investor. Yeah. Well, I, I would just say that um, there, there's a specific, part to the question and a general part to the question. Okay, so in general, what I would say is one of the things which technology does is, is it allows large volumes of transactions to occur in very short periods of time. And that's been, um, you know, for I, I can remember at MySpace, for example, uh, when we were very early on, um, I met with somebody at Chase about doing uh, credit card acquisitions. And um, I said, you know, I think we can get you signups at very cost effective price. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we normally, you know, we normally, if we can, if we can get a customer for $47, um, you know, I'm a hero. And they were using print and TV as a cost per acquisition. And I said, well, how about if I can do it at half the price? And he said, what? And I said, pre-qualified, half the price. And he said, that would be great. And we signed an insertion order and I got him, I think 150,000 customers the first month, sent him the invoice and he called me in a panic. And he said, you know, you've spent my acquisition budget for the next two years in one month. And I said, well, you didn't tell me you only wanted 10 or $15,000, uh, you know, of acquisitions. And he said, well, I had no idea you could generate that much interest that quickly. So the part of what happened here and part of what happened in the flash crash that happened with high uh, frequency trading is that technology will find the weakest point in the system immediately. So yes, there was a problem. Yes, people will address the problem. They'll address it from a regulatory standpoint. They'll address it from an internal problem, but only until um, the next problem happens. And if we knew, one of the things you learn very early on about technology is the reason technology is always late, it's always late, is because you can only estimate how long it will take you if it works. And then you find a bug. And that bug may take you a day to solve, a week to solve, or may never be solved because the architecture is wrong. And if you knew what the problem was, you wouldn't induce it into the system. So 
I, I think we have to understand and accept, and for the most part we do, we go on vaccine information websites and crash it. We buy tickets to concerts and we crash it. It just so happens fintech, people are very, very sensitive when their financial things um, are not working properly. But even today, Bank of America's site goes down, Merrill Lynch's site goes down. Um, and we just have to understand that that's part of technology going forward in the, in the future. As to the particulars of GameStop and stocks which are shorted um, uh, with more shares short than they have in the float, that's something since I've been involved in the public markets intimately in the last 25 years, I don't understand. I can't explain it. And when you ask the regulators, they can't explain it either. Now, what goes on in the back? Well, we're, we're going to ask a regulator, Joe, in just a moment yeah. and see. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot, that. Lance. Get ready. Yeah. I just don't understand how if you have a million shares in your float, you can have 2 million, 3 million shares short. And so, again, one of the things technology does is when they find a an inefficiency in the system, whether it's high frequency trading or whatever it is, it has the ability to focus the fire hose on it very quickly. And that makes the problem infinitely more intense. All right, Lance, I think he threw down the gauntlet there. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if I have the answer. Uh, what, I, what I would say is, is that, you know, if you, if you sort of look at this, right, um, what I said earlier about, uh, you know, high velocity frictionless trading or, or, or transactions played a relatively significant role in what happened here, okay? Uh, in addition to that, you sort of got to mix in social media as part of what's going on here because, you know, you had essentially millions of small investors being egged on through uh, social media, particularly Reddit. And I don't know if anybody knows the name Vincent Gill. I suspect some of my friends here may know him, uh, AKA Roaring Kitty, uh, as he's called. Um, really sort of egged on folks to, um, to really drive this stock to unbelievable level. I mean, think about it for a minute. GameStop is essentially a physical, you know, the blockbuster, if anybody remembers blockbuster, is essentially the blockbuster video rental store of, you know, the gaming business. And yet still, through social media and the desire to sort of punish Melvin Capital for shorting the stock. You had tens of millions of people that invested and drove the stock up to four, five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars a share. The reality is, is that the regulatory system, and to the point that Joe was making about sort of, you know, the capital positions and the, the ability for uh, Robin Hood and others to sort of handle that sort of volume was was completely misunderstood and there were gaps in the system and what's going on right now is that congress regulators are really asking questions around is robin hood in these sorts of platforms encouraging consumers average consumers not sophisticated consumers but average consumers to take unnecessary risks and thereby have significant, significant impact on their network, positive or negative. It can be incredibly positive, it can be incredibly negative. And so I think the jury is out on this, uh, both from a regulatory perspective, there's a lot of work going on to investigate, evaluate, analyze. Um, and I suspect though, at the end of the day, Dan, uh, we will likely see, um, an acceleration in legislative and regulatory oversight in this space. I think that's gonna happen. Yeah, I think, um, and what I wanted to sort of mention and sort of putting on my former regulator hat, um, 
the, the whole situation, especially as it, as, as it um, intersected with Robin Hood, because that's one I'm most familiar with, um, it's the question of suitability. Um, are these investors, do they really know what they're, what they're getting themselves into? And what responsibility does an organization like Robin Hood have to assess the suitability of its customers. We saw there was a young man who killed himself because he thought he owed Robin Hood a boatload of money. Like something went wrong in the system when young people are killing themselves over stock transactions. Like that's, there, there, there's a pivot point there where we have to say, you know, we have to question as a society who, who we want to have access to, you know, various sorts of investments. And I'm not saying that retail shouldn't have access. I think it's it's a dialogue that, that we all as a society need to have as we have more technology, more push for retail and unsophisticated investors to access various investments. Um, and then the regulators kind of sitting in the middle of this trying to arbitrate, you know, these various things. So I think from, from my vantage point, it, it just comes back to suitability because as a banker for many years, like you're, before you even get the customer in the door, you have to identify what they, what products that, that they are, that they, are they're suitable for. Like, and these are big corporates. So, and there are corporations that I wouldn't let do certain things. Like, so I think that we need to have an honest discussion about what different kinds of investors can do and the levels to which they can do things if we want it. So I think that that's, I think that's an, an appropriate dialogue to have. Still giving access to people to give access to things, but um, the the do nothing strategy is not working, as we learned. But by the way, I just want to make one quick comment. Um, you know, we, we need to recognize that regulatory activity doesn't always restrict. Right, regulatory activity can also drive innovation. Okay. And I'll give you one quick example of that. Many, many years ago, before these mega banks formed, you know, banks could only operate on a state by state basis. Mm -hmm. And it was a sort of gap in the regulatory system that enabled first and foremost, Bank of America and then many others to essentially begin to create these mega banks. And so, you know, regulation um, is, can also help to drive innovation. And the idea of not, something not being regulated um, to help consumers or to pre protect consumers uh, is, is sort of a, a misnomer. I think um, we need to recognize there's value in regulatory activity. Just ask the folks in Texas, okay, who, who didn't have insulated pipes and insulated windmills. Uh, you know, there are insulated windmills in, in, in Alaska still working and they stopped working in Texas because they chose not to follow regulatory guidelines. So we just need to recognize there's value there. Can you have too much regulation? Absolutely. But there is value in the process of regulatory activity. I'll, I'll leave it and let Joe jump in. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different slant. No. No surprise, okay. Uh, first of all, I think GameStop was an anomaly, you know? And when you go back and you go layer and layer and layer, if it wasn't, then Reddit could drive any stock, anytime, any, or, you know, or, or people with loud voices could move stocks, okay? And so I think, we have to be careful and we have to understand GameStop all the way through and not say because of this one instance or a handful of instances, this can happen. The second thing I would say is that we're also in, this, in a period of this SPAC frenzy. And if you are an individual investor, a non-institutional -inv non investor, you look at the SPACs and you say, wow, I can say, I can have a first look at something at $10 a share. It's trading at $20 a share. It makes an announcement and it goes to $60 a share. Then I can decide, okay, I'll put my money in at $10 a share. And 
what what the perception is of the individual investor has always been that the bigger institutions, the banks, the investment banks and things like that, drive the regulation and drive the system. And when they go to when they go to regulate it, those regulations, which I agree, I'm I'm in general theoretically, you know, I believe in stop signs. I believe in in speed limits. I believe in suitability and all of that. But there is a perception, and some of it is real, that those are um, regulations that protect the big investor and the big financial institutions, whether it's through lobbying or um, more sophisticated ways of explaining their story, and point it to, you know, oh, it's this one guy on Reddit. We need to we need to make sure that that one guy on Reddit can exist, as opposed to saying, wait a minute, this whole idea of SPACs is is not quite fair. It's it, to individual investors. So would would a regulation that you're talking about would it would it somehow regulate SPACs so that you know you know people can't get in a, you know ahead of other people? It's a very slippery slope, and um, you have really two sides, and that's what's driving a lot of this GameStop frenzy is when they have a they, when they have something that they can point to and say, "Aha, we can control the system from the little guy." That just makes it worse, I think. Yeah, I I, I hear you, Joe. I the only other quick comment I'd make is is that. Um, you know, part of the part of the challenge that, in particular, uh, Robinhood um, had and other retail brokerage uh, firms had, given the volume of transactions, sort of the frictionless nature of the movement, was this issue around depositing capital, right, as it relates to um, the requirements with its clearinghouses, and if you don't understand that part of the equation which was clear, people didn't understand that part of the equation, you had what kind of happened, which was the stop sell and, and, and all, all the sort, and then the trickle down effect of all of that. So if you don't understand sort of the systemic effects, you can really create havoc. Now, in no way would I ever say that, you know, what Roaring Kitty did on Reddit should be, in any way regulated, okay? <laughs> People make their choices, but understanding sort of the whole system and the systemic effects that can occur is important for all sort of folks within the value chain, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, when this all shakes out, I'm gonna be curious to see how much of the volume was small individual investors and how much of the volume were high frequency momentum traders and how much the volume were institutions. Who that's were fair. Saying, I know, agree with you. That, that, that's, I guess that's all I'm saying. And yeah. it's, you know, there's, there's somebody to, you know, there's, there's something to focus on here. Yeah. We just need to understand, you know, at, at the end. Agreed. I, as I said, I think the jury's still out, still early. Well, we will see scholarly research on this event for the next few years, but you need the data and it's just gonna take some time. All right, let me change gears a little bit and uh, go into everybody's favorite FinTech subject, which is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is uh, the most visible uh, application of the blockchain technology, but certainly not, not the only one. I hope we get to some of that uh, in a moment. Um, to stay in on that, I mean, is Bitcoin worth fifty thousand uh, dollars? Is it worth anything? Um, can someone make a proper business case for cyber currencies, maybe in the payment system? Um, I just, I think it was yesterday or the day before, Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, accepted their first payment for services in Bitcoin. That felt significant to me. 
Uh, this morning, I read that China is moving aggressively to plan for a, um, uh, a, a central bank based uh, cyber currency. So things are happening. I don't know where they're going. Um, should we own Bitcoin? Should it be in our portfolio? How do we even do that? What? That's not one question. That's a lot of questions. But but yeah, what it's, do you think? Certainly, there's a lot of a lot of dimensions to that, and certainly um, watching the the central bank with what's called the central bank digital currency initiative, and that's happening globally with a lot of central banks, and certainly China is really kind of driving the bus on that one. I was in China like a year and a half ago and to, trying to do a panel on cryptocurrencies in China. And I was flat out told, no, you are not allowed to talk about cryptocurrencies in China. But I would get pan I get other people like at the conference saying, we want you to talk about it. Please talk about it. We're, we're trying to study it. Even people from the central bank in, in China were like, you know, it's not allowed here, but we want to talk about it. Um, so I think following what China does in, especially in the, in the central bank digital currency space is really important. But broadly, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, you know, it has a, has a lot of dimensions to it. Um, and certainly, and what I've said for years is as, as there's kind of institutional adoption of, of, the, of these currencies, it, it'll have more value. Like you, you look at a lot of the major asset managers, most of my former clients are taking very, very small positions. Some big insurance companies, asset managers are taking relatively small positions, but hundred million dollars is, is a lot of money in, in crypto land. So, you know, I certainly think that, you know, some firms are starting to dip their toe in the water, but then, then you have to take a step back and, and look at, you know, what was, the kind of the cryptocurrency originally devised for. Um, and if you look, if you read the original white paper on, on Bitcoin, if you know, if you know the whole history of it, it was exactly the opposite of what's sort of happening now. It's more institutionalization of, of the of, of the currency. So I, I just find it interesting from the vantage point of like Bitcoin is is exploding in its popularity and in its price because institutions are now getting involved, which was kind of an antithetical to why it was started, started to begin with. So I'll kind of throw those couple of things out there. Yeah, well, so, so first of all, no surprise, um, I've owned Bitcoin. Uh, um, I've never sold it. I bought it four years ago and I bought it a month ago. So I'm a long-term believer in Bitcoin. Um, so, Secondly, I would say what you just described, Suzanne, is every technical innovation that I've been involved with. Nobody started personal building small personal computers because you know they 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 all started because they were the anti IBM, right? Social networks started because they were you know anti the way people were doing things. And then they all evolved into mainstream businesses, you know, and there's no more mainstream business today than Google and Facebook and Microsoft and all that. And yet they were all counterculture when they started. They were all us, the little guy against the man. So, you know, that, that doesn't um, bother me at all. I look at it as being there, there's a, a lot, of, lot, lot of parts to Dan's question, okay? The first question is, is Bitcoin or some form of digital currency here to stay? And I obviously believe, yes, it's here to stay. Is it worth $50,000? I don't know. I mean, you know, is a Van Gogh worth $300 million? Is gold worth $1,500? $3, $3, I don't know. I don't know what it's worth. If I knew, believe me, I wouldn't be on this panel. I'd either be buying or selling and nobody knows, okay? You can look at the mega trends and say, it should be more valuable as more people accept it. You know, it should be more valuable because the supply is constrained. It could be less valuable because it's gone up so far so fast. History says it's very rare that happens. I don't know. Then the third part of the question is the whole concept of blockchain. 
And while I've been in technology for many, many, many years, I'm the last person that would say I understand it. You know, uh, uh, people used to ask me in 1982, they, they used to, when they found out I was doing personal computer software, they would say, I don't know what computers are. I don't know what software is. Um, you know, can you explain it to me? And I really couldn't. I mean, I, I still am mystified that I send an email or a text and I hit send and the other person gets it. I mean, I can't, you know, somebody says to me, explain the internet. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, and I, I've given up trying, you know, there are really smart people who do understand it and can take advantage. But with blockchain, what I see it solves, like Lance mentioned open source, when, oh, when, when the first person said open source or Linux, they, they could have been tarred and feathered. That whole concept was so alien, alien to what's going on. The way I look at blockchain is it's frictionless um, or, or not frictionless, less friction. And each advancement in technology accomplishes that. It's transparent. It's just really a big database. Um, it's sort of like cloud computing. Instead of sending it up to the cloud, it's on you know, each individual's computer. But the big applications are not only in fintech, but someday, you know, today you go to the supermarket and you go to the produce section and you look at the apples and they say, you know, Washington State apples. And they could be Washington State apples. They could be frozen Washington State apples that have been thawed. They could have been picked three days ago. They could have been picked three weeks ago. There will come a time and it's not too far in the future when things like that, you'll be able to know what farm it came from, when it was picked, how it was shipped, how long it sat in the back room and how it got to your section on the produce table. And that has dramatic implications in supply chain, whether it's FinTech supply chain or produce supply chain or the movement of goods and services. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing some stuff where I'm, I'm buying some, some uh, products from Asia. And five years ago, it used to be, you know, like a dark hole. It would sort of be manufactured and sort of been, it was then on a ship and then it was in a port and then it cleared customs. And one day you'd hit the lottery and they would say, come pick it up tomorrow. At, at some point, you're gonna be able to trace whatever you're buying from the time, from the raw material to the manufacturer, to the shipment, to your dock. That has security implications, cost implications, and that's the technology. That's what got me intrigued to blockchain and digital currencies to begin with. And that's the, the, that's the, the real value here is in the blockchain. Hey, Dan, I, I know we're running out of time. So oh, there's um, just enough time Lance, just, for you to forecast make, Bitcoin for the next 12 months. Yeah, let me let me just make uh, three points on yeah. on uh, Bitcoin. The first I would say is uh, watch what happens with central banks. Um, they they're now starting to indicate uh, that they'll produce um, digital currencies of their own. Uh, in the future. And I, I, I think really watch what's going on there um, because that will have an effect on, on sort of the, the, uh, the continued viability of Bitcoin and how that evolves over, over time. So that would be one thing. Um, the, the second thing I'd say is I do believe with, the, with Joe and, and with Susan, Suzanne uh, that cryptocurrencies do have staying power. Um, you know, I, I think they're going to be around. I think they're going to create and provide the value that uh, Joe just outlined. But I'd say it's not yet for the faint of art, the heart. Uh, it's still highly speculative um, and somewhat volatile. And I would say if you're going to get involved, 
uh, you need to make sure you're sophisticated enough and that you have enough of a high risk tolerance uh, to, to, get, to get involved. Um, that's my view. Uh, you know, Joe may have a different point of view, but that's at least- 100% and for a very small portion of your portfolio. Yeah, don't, don't risk your assignment tuition on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah don't so, risk your like, assignment tuition. away with that. <laughs> you know, it's- be, Assignment be tuition would be a better investment. <laughs> right? yeah. I have to make that yeah. statement. Uh, there. Those would be my three points. Okay. Yeah, it's, some, it's something you should you should dabble with. You, sh you should be able to lose all of it and be okay. It's like, you should not be putting 100% of your- uh, of your 401k and Bitcoin. I think that's I think that's a message that we're saying, but it's it's an interesting avenue to explore and it's the next, you know, it's it's what's next. It's as 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 explorers, as people who are innovative and interested in the world, you know, explore and be curious and you know, dabble a little bit. And in, in in all innovation, it requires some people on the early end. Um, and never think that you're getting in too late. So many people say to me, oh, it's 50,000. Like, I feel like I got in too late. Like the guys that got in at 10,000 bucks, they got in too late. So, you know, it's never, it's never too late if you get in and you can, you can lose that money. So that's my message. Well, this has been great. I, I uh, am very sad to wrap this up. Uh, we need several hours to do this right, I think. Uh, it's been a great program. And uh, I really want to uh, extend my warmest thanks to the three of you for making time to support the school with your involvement in this discussion today. And uh, at this point, I'll just turn it over to Dean Yeltikin to offer some closing remarks. Very briefly, I just want to thank everybody, all our panelists, Joe, Lance, and Suzanne, and our moderator, Dan, for being with us today. This, I could have gone on and listened to this conversation for a long time. It looks like we, we do definitely need a follow-up to this. And for uh, complete disclosure as well, as I'm speaking to you from this computer, I am running a blockchain validator node in the back end of it um, on actually scientific scholarly discoveries, which we can talk about at some other point in time but lots of interesting things are happening. So I hope you will also keep an eye out for the continuation of our Simon Proud Industry uh, Expert Series because we will definitely continue the series. And we had over a hundred uh, folks uh, come in and listen and learn with us. So thank you very much, much appreciated and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>